So um, this is the meeting of the Board of Finance Audit Subcommittee, um, uh, January 5th. And I just realized I have the minutes for the Board of Finance. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, I, sorry, this isn't um, my most organized. Um, so uh, this is the regular meeting of the Board of Finance Audit Subcommittee will be held on Tuesday, January 5th at 6 p.m. via WebEx in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, item number one is to call the meeting to order. Item number two is the Pledge of Allegiance. As long as everyone else doesn't mind, we'll defer that to the full Board of Finance meeting, uh, just to save some time right now. Uh, so item number three is to hear, consider, and adapt a meeting schedule, meeting calendar for 2021, suggested date, June 1, 2021, September 7, 2021, and December 7, 2021 at 6 p.m. just prior to the Board of Finance meeting. And then additional dates may be added if we think that's necessary. Um, I do think we should add some dates, but I wanted to talk to the committee um, to determine if we should do that. So, I, I I think June is too long, Mary. Um, considering, okay. you know, the the Board of Finance is waiting for an update on the DPW audit report, and uh, you know, I think we should try to um, get more periodic updates to them. So I would suggest um, we we meet either next month or in in March. Next month might actually be easier because March we have budget and right. and hopefully we can have an update that knocks off a few more of the items on the audit report so that we can uh, give a better update to the board of finance that would be my suggestion okay um so i'm looking at my um calendar so we could try to fit a meeting in maybe um January 19th, or else we can just wait till February and do February 2nd before the Board of Finance meeting. Yeah, I, I might suggest February. I'll, um, I'll ask okay. so, Con and Jared. I mean, I think that gives everybody a little bit more time to, uh, be, our, our hope was that uh, we could present the Board of Finance a summary where we, you know, could at least give them some statistics on how many of the items had been closed. And I, I think if we do it another one in January, we, we just might not have enough time. So I, I think February, that would be my preference. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. No, I agree. I, agree. Um, I think February works. Okay. Okay. Jai, that could be you as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think when it, um, I'll make a motion to add February 2nd to those um, meetings that I had originally read. Um, do I have a second? Yes. Uh, Lori is the second. Um, so I guess all in favor. <laughs> um, that's Lori and I. Um, so the that motion passes. Um, to to amend, um, and then I guess uh, we can always add additional meetings after that meeting if we to see what we think we need to do. Um, so I guess can I have a motion to adopt the calendar for 2021? Lori and I will second her. So all in favor? Um, Lori and I. Uh, so the motion passes and we have a calendar. Um, the next item on our agenda is to hear, consider, and approve the meeting minutes of December 1, 2020. And um, 
Lori brought to my attention that I omitted um, from the agenda that we were supposed to um, have our organizational meeting. So um, once we approve the minutes, then I will add add that in um, to the meeting. Um, if everyone is okay with that. Um, were there any other items in the minutes, Lori, that, um, you, that we need to adjust them for? No, I, um, from my perspective, the minutes look good. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, all Hi, I'm sorry. To... Yep. I'm sorry. This is Prue. Can you just repeat what I, I didn't understand what you just said? I'm sorry. Oh, um, I, I was supposed to include on our agenda for, um, this meeting, the, uh, the organizational meeting items. So we will add that into the agenda as we go, as long as I get a two thirds majority vote. Um, so right now we're make, we're going to make a motion to approve the minutes as presented to us. Um, all in favor. Uh, Lori and I, so the minutes for December 1, 2020 are approved. Um, item number four on the agenda is to discuss the specific request for the presentation in, the, in February for the annual audit for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2020 to the Board of Finance by Mr. Joseph Sensafani. Um, I'm not going to read all his titles uh, of um, PK, PKF O'Connor Davies LLP. Um, so traditionally, it's the set, subcommittee that provides some guidance to Mr. Santafani in what the Board of Finance would like to hear in their presentation. In the past, um, some of our, our main um, items that we like to hear are um, updates on our fund balance, on the pension, on OPEB um, type issues. Um, we like to hear anything that he feels, hear about anything that he feels is important for us to know in general, um, new updates and pronouncements. Um, and the way any changes to the way things have been presented from prior years. Um, uh, so, so I guess the, the question is what other types of items, if any, we want him to add to his usual presentation. Um, Mary, if I could, I, I had one suggestion and it was on the um, commitment footnote. I, yeah, you'll yeah. have to bear with me I while well, I pull up the CAFR, which I don't have uh, directly. I actually, I have it in front of me. I just have to get to the page number. There's a footnote in the okay. CAFR that I, I thought was um, somewhat confusing because it what it does is it shows authorized capital projects that are open. Yeah. It shows pending, pending, or it shows the spending that's been on those projects to date, and then it mm -hmm. shows the uh, remaining um, open items. And I, I think there was confusion there, at least on my part, for two reasons. One, that what the footnote indicates is that we have $50 million of remaining spending on projects that are currently authorized. And I think the question that would be helpful to understand is to what extent has that 50 million already been bonded? Um, and if it hasn't been bonded, is it reflected or can it be reflected somewhere within our waterfall schedule? It, it, you know, because again, this is this is presumably money that's been approved and authorized and that additional 50 million, if, if the plan is to bond it versus an expectation of grants, that can happen at any time. And I don't think we're, you know, we don't typically count that in our waterfall because our waterfall shows and reflects dollars that have already been bonded and that we have current debt, debt service obligations for. So I personally had not focused on that until I, I read the footnote in the, in the financials. So I think it would just be helpful, whether it's Joe or management, to help us understand 
what that means, you know, where that $50 million stands, has it been bonded, has it not been bonded, and, and what is that going to look like from a timing perspective in terms of how it impacts our waterfall and our, our capital project, um, you know, availability, if you will. Okay. So, that, so there was that, and then there's a related footnote, and again, bear with me, I'm trying to speak and call it up at the same time. There's a related footnote that talks about construction commitments, and uh, yeah. I wasn't clear on the two. So I, I, I just, those are two that I think are would be helpful for Mr. Centifani to just, you know, again, along with management, provide a little insight on, because both of them have to do with op open commitments that we have on, um, on capital spending. So that's my yeah, one yeah. suggestion. My other suggestion is there is a footnote, and again, I'm pulling this up, so I'll give you these numbers in a moment. There's a footnote that lays out all of our investments for the town, and it, yeah, yeah. it breaks out the information to show effectively whether the investments are liquid or illiquid. So some of our investments are liquid, some of them have are restricted in terms of having periods of time where you know you have to you'd have to wait to get your, your money out if you will and the the question i had on the footnote is that it presents all of those investments in a lump sum which is not particularly helpful because i think many or most of those investments sit in our pension funds which is you know that money's not supposed to be liquid and we don't really care about that but what i wanted right. to understand there was in terms of the rest of the town's investments, where does, can we break that out and, and where does that sit? Um, because to the extent those are, that's money in the general fund or that's money that, you know, could potentially have to be accessed at some time in the near future, or even if we don't plan on it, but it's sitting in the general fund, I think understanding what that looks like, where it's invested in that liquidity would be really helpful information to understand. And we, we don't really look at that at any other point in time. Uh, you know, we don't have a good view of that in any of our normal discussions. So I thought that during the review of the financial statements, it might be a, a good time to just provide to provide that overview to uh, to the board of finance. If that's okay. if that's okay, I believe that is in there somewhere because I think there's very specific guidelines from the state on how our our cash or our fund balance can be invested. Uh, Jared may want to jump in if if, um, if he knows it in better detail than I do, but but I seem to remember that from years past that that we have to be fa fairly liquid for the town cash, um, like it it goes to like a sweet account, but I think there's, there's requirements for for liquidity. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's true. Yeah, let me let me pull it up for a moment. By the way, just just to back up before I forget, so the the capital projects authorization footnote that I referred to before, and the fifty million dollars, that's the footnote that's on page forty three of the financial statements, um, and it's, the title of it is capital projects authorizations. So that was the the piece that we that I, I think it would be helpful to just you know help everyone understand what that means. And on the investments, yes, I definitely understand that we have policies. It, it's just the numbers that are in there are, again, presented in a lump sum. And let me just scroll through here and, and try to find this footnote. I actually have provided that as a comment to Mr. Centifani and asked him if he could maybe just put subtotals within that footnote so that you could see what it was, but he didn't have time to do it. Um, okay, here it is. It's okay. on page 44. Um, uh, footnote number 2A, and it basically says the town's investments, including restricted investments, consists of the following types and maturities. And, you know, it, it lists the various investments that the town has. But again, I, I didn't think it was particularly helpful because it lumps pension investments in with, you know, operating operating funds, if you will, or other investments. So I had, I had hoped to just understand that a bit better and get a breakout to, to keep the pension investments separately, because I, I think that's really a, you know, th that doesn't really have to do with the town's operations. Um, so, you know, other than that, I think my suggestion, I know we, we have uh, some discussion on the pension um, and OPEB 
plans tonight. Um, so maybe the, maybe it's a Q and A for the CAFR meeting, but but I think that would be also helpful to have Mr. Centifani focus on um, that information. There are there's a lot of information in the CAFR. There are 20 pages, I believe, of footnotes on pension and OPEB. There are yeah. also another 10 pages of supplemental schedules, and it's just a lot of information to process. So if he could highlight that information into something digestible for the board, I think that would also be useful. And those are my only suggestions. Okay, okay. but there's three points you want to add. I think he usually does cover the pension and OPEP, but we'll make sure he knows that. And then we always like to talk the fund balance with them as yep. well. Ms. Okay. Charlton, would you like us to reach out to Mr. Santafani, or do you want to send him an email with these questions, or uh, how do you, how do you want to relay these to to him? I, I defer to Mary on that. Mary, how do we usually do that? Um, we can probably just email, and I guess Lori and I can talk after the meeting to decide who who contacts him and uh, work on what we want to ask them. Um, okay. And we'll just uh, obviously guess if we can just put it in in an email to him. Um, he's aware that we were talking about this tonight. He was unable to attend, uh, so he knows I'm going. That was my plan to email him anything we'd like him to include. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, okay. Um, so, uh, are there any other questions or discussion on this item, or should I move on to um, item number six? Just one quick question, Mary. I mean, I know that the financial statements have been uh, issued already. Is there anything that that the this committee does in terms of, you know, recommending that the board of finance accept them, or or is is we've it just never done any type of recommendation? Although you, I. Forgot I was going to ask a question um, to to Jared while you were talking, and then it went out of my head. And that is that normally the Board of Finance, right at this meeting, gets the printed copy of the audited financial statements. So we have a hard copy of the um, the CAFR, the um, and and the other reports that he does for the Board of Ed, um, the EDO what is it EDO one and um, the recommendations. We usually get handed that at this meeting um, of the board of for the Board of Finance, and all members of the Board of Finance get that copy. And so I wanna make a request that that gets sent out as soon as possible to the board, because it's very hard working with a PDF copy of a report that, that is so large. So we really do need that printed report, and it's a report we've referred to all year long. Um, and so I, I'd like to make put that request in that we get that as soon as possible, and it goes to the full board. Mary, does Joe distribute that, or does he give a pile of these reports to the town and then they get them to us? I think that he, he used to give a pile of the reports to the town. They were just handed out at the Board of Finance meeting, so I don't know what the process was. Got it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if he might make everybody's life easier if he just mailed them to us instead of going through a two-step process, but I guess we can we can uh, figure yeah, that out yeah. with him. Uh, um, okay. Okay, um, so item number six, to review and discuss the status of the town administration's response to the findings of the Fairfield, Connecticut Public Works Department review report on the results of the procedures performed. Oh, you're right. There, somehow we did lose an item from the agenda. Sorry. <laughs> there was supposed to be one other um, agenda item um, for the um, for the audit reports, and I don't know if um, for the internal audit piece, and I don't know if that was my, what I that uh, that I dropped it off on the draft of my agenda that I sent to. Um, 
But anyway, so item number six is to hear the update. Um, Connie sent out the tracker schedule that Lori and, and she have been meeting on and working together. So um, I guess we want to um, discuss where we are and what the next steps are and how to pr proceed. Um, and then I think for uh, the meeting we just added for February 2nd, we're going to really want to go through it point by point and hopefully it can be updated as much as possible by that time period. Um, okay. Um, well, as you know, I had previously submit uh, the audit report with responses in report form on December 1st. And yes. Lori so graciously uh, compiled all those responses into an audit tracker. And she also included um, several follow up questions uh, to the audit recommendations and responses, um, which I have been working on. Uh, I met with Lori, Jane, Tom, and Jared on December 8th. And we all spoke on how are we going to uh, tackle responding to all of these audit recommendations. Um, what I have been doing is I've been tackling each uh, audit response and follow up uh, questions in chronological sequence and writing responses. And I've been submitting those responses on the audit tracker, which you received yesterday. And right now it's my goal to address all the items in the independent audit report in one form or another. Um, especially those, I can personally address those that pertain to auditing, finance, and internal controls. And going forward, I'd like to uh, provide them as they're completed on a maybe biweekly basis so you can see um, what the responses are and you can also uh, follow up with any questions that you might have. Um, right now, Lori and I, we recapped the audit tracker, and as it stands now, there's 76 total tracker items, we've deemed that 17 are closed or completed and have sufficient responses. That leaves a balance of 59 open items that remain to be addressed or are in process. Now, once we get the completed and approved purchasing policies and procedures uh, document and the associated manual, that will Probably that will most likely address 17 to 20 of the audit um, open items that are in the tracker. So that leaves us about, that leaves us 42. We, we figure 42 open items other than purchase things that uh, still are open. Um, as you know, we have a new director of public works and he's familiarizing himself with the operations right now. He's been supplied with a copy of the independent EPW audit report, and he's aware of the findings and recommendations. I've met with him once or twice already, and I've offered him my assistance in completing any open items, and um, perhaps maybe we can have a meeting and uh, discuss how we're going to tackle uh, you know, the, any of the, those open items that directly affect EPW operations. And uh, okay. I just want to follow up. I know that uh, that you you're scheduling another meeting, another uh, adding a meeting for February second, and we'll certainly do an update then with whatever additional information we have. And then beyond that, I know that the first elect woman would like to give a more, uh, much more meaningful update uh, sometime around March or so to. Uh, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a priority for her. It's important to her and uh, especially any of the recommendations that relate to the fill pile and what prompted the audit to happen. So mm -hmm. she would, uh, as I said, she would like to give a more meaningful update, which uh, as Connie mentioned, would include hopefully, uh, you know, the impact of the, uh, the purchasing policy manual procedures and so uh, so we, we will that we're hoping that we will have some, something a little bit more for you on February 2nd but uh, in March we're hoping to have a uh, much broader 
uh, response. Okay. okay. And then are some of the solutions um, delayed because of the cost? So they may be um, coming to us in the form of in the bud budget that will be presented to us shortly. Well, some of the or open are items they not yet. Right, pertain to, for example, software, um, a time and attendance, a software package, uh, a queue alert system at DPW operations, those sort of things, which obviously are going to take time and uh, research on how to implement them. Uh, some of the uh, items are ongoing. We're implementing credit cards throughout town departments. So we're, you know, tackling that department after department one at a time. Um, so some of these issues are still ongoing and uh, may take a little bit of time. That's why they're still open. Yeah, I and first of all, can I just say um, thank you to Connie for all your work on this. Thank you, Jared, uh, for your leadership also. I, I think... Um, it would be great when we get to the next, you know, meeting. I, I personally think there's a number of these that can be knocked off pretty easily. You know, in fact, some of them may be closed. We just had open questions or clarifications on the responses just to ensure that they were addressed. So, um, the, you know, the top level statistics don't sound terrific right now. Um, but I, I, I do think that many of these can, I should, well, maybe not many, but a number of these can be closed. Um, hopefully before our, our next update. But I, I think for the ones that are that will take longer um, or are still in process, you know, that's that's fine. I don't think I from my personal perspective, I wasn't I didn't have any expectation that we could uh, resolve all these, you know, in a in a very short time period. I, I think I always believed that it would take us a while to get through all of this stuff. And so I think the key thing for me would be you know, we're going to have a certain number of findings. Some of them will be closed out. Some of them will be in process. Some of them may not be started yet. But I think the key would be, and in that tracker, to address a target date for completion on the ones that are in process or or haven't been started yet. Because, you know, listen, if, if some of these, you know, if we have a couple of them that require a software solution and we've got a budget for it and we've got to spend money and we've got to then deal with implementation and training, you know, that may take us till December 31st, which is fine. I, I think right now the, the um, you know, we just don't know on some of these. So I think to the extent they um, have dates on them, that's helpful. So what, what's closed out is closed out. What's in process is in process. What's open is open, but we, we have a, um, you know, a date for completion that will, you know, help us to not, you know, in addition to having something to track, we won't have to keep revisiting these at every meeting. If we know they're not supposed to be done for, you know, six months because there are multiple steps involved. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, that will do the trick and, and we can certainly speak offline, you know, um, on any of the questions. If, if there's, you know, ways that we can clarify things, just responses, just to get them off the list before the next update, that would be terrific. Um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. You know, I know it's a big job. Thank you again for, uh, all the work on this. I think the purchasing policy, you know, Connie said it, I think there's at least 17 recommendations that relate to the purchasing policy. Um, we will talk about this more during the board of finance meeting, but a draft has been prepared. Um, Mr. Centifanti will hopefully be engaged to review it. He has, um, in the proposal he's given us to review it, he said that he can complete his review by the end of March. And then, you know, to the extent there's any revisions or tweaks that have to be incorporated after his review, the policy can be finalized after the end of March, training, whatever we have to do. So, you know, even purchasing policy that we've put a, long, a lot of work into, I think it, it'll still take a little time before it's fully rolled out, right? So, um, you know, we get it. Uh, these things take time. There's a, a lot of moving pieces, um, but I, I think we just wanted to make sure that we could keep the board up to date on progress and status and and timing. So, um, you know, the, the tracker will be helpful in that regard. And, you know, thank you again for uh, 
for all the work to date. We have way to, ways to go, but you know, it's it's uh, moving along. So, Mary, I don't know if you have any Madam words. Madam Chair, could I, do you mind if I respond? Sure, of course. So I, I just, I don't want to create any false hope or anything because I, we're going to continue to work on these. And when, when you guys want to have updates, we'll, we'll obviously, you know, we're, we're here and we'll give you updates on it. But, you know, the reality is that, yes, these are, there's a lot of these and they're going to take a long time. And it would be uh, different, I think, if we had a lot of uh, staff and a lot of resources to devote to this, where we could, you know, we could more easily project and put dates to these things. But the reality is we have one internal auditor who has a, a, you know, a, a lot of other work to do in addition to this. And I, my, honestly, my concern is that in create, putting dates to any of these would be pretty meaningless at this point because you, because there's only one person working on them, the, you know, if there's one thing that comes up, that's gonna throw everything off and it's gonna throw the whole schedule off and it's just, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, we, 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 we want to ourselves to be responsive to the recommendations in the audit, and we will continue to be. Uh, I'm just hesitant to to attach dates to any of these. Yeah, maybe, and and, and so I I can appreciate that. I think maybe I'll just throw out two things. One is that you know dates can certainly change. You know, I if. If other priorities come up, that's fine. But I think to not have any target dates is is tough to deal with, right? Because then, you know, no one has a it's kind of a deadline to work to. The other maybe the other thought, Jared, is um one of the things that we haven't done with the tracker is is prioritize the items. Well, I shouldn't say that. Clearly, we've prioritized things that relate to the purchasing policy, and that's being handled as a separate work stream. But in terms of these other, you know, 42 items, um, you know, some are more important than others. And so the other thing that would be helpful is, you know, maybe you guys look at this and you say, you know, listen, yeah, there's 42 open recommendations, but there's, you know, six of them that are really, really important to us for various reasons. And so, you know, our goal is to get these six done by a certain day and then we'll We'll work on the rest. You know, I don't know if it's six. I don't know what the number is, but I think, you know, sometimes when you have something of this scale, the temptation is to kind of knock off the easy ones, you know, and then the the tougher ones, you know, they take longer to get to. So I think, you know, that's a judgment. Joe uh, Centifani did did pri he did um, use a scale to prioritize these, in his opinion. On the report, you know, he rated things as either internal control deficiencies or, um, you know, in some cases he said these were just recommendations to get to best practices or they were things that would promote efficiencies versus internal control deficiencies. So I think, you know, that priority scale might be one way to look at it and to say, you know, listen, efficiencies are good and best practices are great, but you know, maybe our goal is to make sure we tackle anything that's an internal control deficiency and give ourselves a, you know, a reasonable timeline to deal with it. And, and that I'm sure will involve people beyond Connie, you know, at DPW or elsewhere. But those are just some thoughts to, to think about. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll have further discussions. But, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you have a, you know, any, any response to that, but that's how I might think about it. Yeah, I appreciate that. We we will take a look at that and how the way that he prioritized them, and then even even there too, uh, like you said, it, there there could be a tendency to want to deal with the the smaller ones first, and you know knock them out. And then, you know, maybe we get a, a larger chunk of time where we can deal with something that's uh, you know more of a risk, uh, but may take more time. And so there, it, it's it's a fluid situation, is all I'm saying. Agreed and, and appreciate that again. Um, you know, thank you uh, for all the work and I see Mr. Brown is joining us. Hi, Jim. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> so, Jim, just to recap, we talked about the audit of the DPW audit tracker. 
Um, and just high level, the report had 76 findings in it. 17 of them are fully closed at this point, um, which leaves 59 items that are either um, open or in process, or we, there's some remaining questions regarding the response. And out of those 59 open items, 17 of those will be addressed via the revised purchasing policy, which we'll talk about separately. And then the remainder, uh, 42 of those are sort of all over the lot, you know, and some of those are probably quick fixes and some of them or may just need a response to a question and some of them are more uh, complex to deal with. So that was the conversation about prioritizing and, you know, putting dates to some of these as a way to, you know, understand how we can eventually get to all of them. So, so do we, do we, um, Talk about an end date. I know it sounds like Jared, you're a little reluctant to put specific dates on some of these items, but can we come up with an end date? Like we we will be in our goal, and maybe it's, it's a goal to be finished by this time, this month. For the yeah, are you talking about for the entire uh, audit? For the entire audit. Everything? Uh, that, uh, we hadn't, we hadn't thought about that. Uh, I have to go back and, uh, you know, take a, that, that may be even a little more tricky because I think there are some, and, you know, we identified a few things that, uh, may or we may or may not even want to do, um, that may not be useful that are in there. And so I, I don't know if we really gone through and identified everything that needs to get done. And um, I would say, you know, it, that, that would be difficult. It would be difficult to nail down and, and, and end date. What, what I had committed to was giving you guys regular updates when you want us to come in and uh, to update you on our progress, we'll, we'll do that. Um, and just to, as as we can, uh, as I mentioned, it's fluid, and we'll we'll knock these out, and especially some of the the smaller ones that we can do in a short amount of time, we'll get those done. And each time that we come before you, we'll we'll let you know what we've done. But as I I don't know if you were on at the time, but as I told Ms. Charlton, we uh, you know we don't it, it's it's very difficult, and I think would be. Uh, meaningless to try to project and over the short term, and I think especially over the long term, it would be uh, it would be difficult as well to set an end date because we you know we don't have uh, a ton of staff uh, you know we don't have five people that that can work on this and are dedicated to it, and so it's it makes it difficult to schedule, um, and so you know we've got one person who's working on it uh, as, as she can uh, to go along with all her other responsibilities. And so it's, it's a tough thing to nail down. I would, look, I, I would love to be able to, to give you an end date. I don't think it would be very meaningful, to be honest with you. So, <clears throat> you know, and, and look, I understand the limitations on, on staff. I think we all do and that nobody has just one job right in the finance department people are wearing multiple hats I, I i but what i do think we should consider and if you can't come to a conclusion tonight because i'm sure we want to get through some of these items and not just talk about timelines and end dates but is, is to at some point come to an agreement on when we want to be finished by because we don't want to be dragging this out none of us do right for another all throughout 2021 and 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 maybe maybe we said we want to be finished by this the end of this fiscal year <clears throat> but i think we should come up with some goals well i think we need to be a little bit more organized than well when we ask you'll you'll be there and answer that's just my thoughts. We don't have to get in a deep conversation about it. And, you know, Lori and Mary can 
get their own opinions on, on that. Yeah, I, I'll just jump in here. I, I do agree with Mr. Brown. I think, um, Jared, just two things I'll mention. I, I think you made the point that there may be one or two of these, you know, or there may be a couple of these items where you decide not to follow the recommendation and you have a reason for that. There's the cost benefit isn't there or you believe the risk isn't there or whatever the reason may be. Once that's articulated and we talk about it, that's closed, right? So that can come off the list if, if that's the case with some of these. Um, I don't think that'll be the case for a lot of them, but I, I just wanted to clarify that. I think to Jim's point, I, you know, I think we should have an end date and in mind. I mean, the report was issued eight months ago, so, and we've done a lot of work since then, and there's been a lot of stuff going on in those eight months, but, you know, it can't have it just an indefinite end date. And so maybe, you know, as you guys go through the tracker and you look at these and you prioritize them, you know, that an end date will come into further focus. You know, I think, um, you know, I'll just say to Mr. Brown, respectfully, I don't think the end of the fiscal year is going to happen here. I think, you know, this, it takes time. You know, we talked about the purchasing policy, even once that's, you know, that's drafted, but the auditors are going to review it. They won't be done till the end of March. There may be revisions after that. Then you've got to, you know, train people and roll it out. So, you know, some of these things do take time. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that, but I think having an indefinite and, you know, having no end date is is probably not where we want to be. I think we have to make a good faith attempt, in my opinion, to, uh, you know, say when we're going to finish this at some point. And if resources are really an issue on some high priority items or items that create risk, then, you know, we should talk about that as well. You know, maybe that involves getting some outside help. You know, I, I don't know. It, it sort of depends on what the priority is and, and what the um, impediments are. So, you know, we can, so if you guys want to think about it, you know, we can, you know, we can do it again. But I, I, I do agree that I don't think we can just have, you know, an indefinite end, end date on this because it's, um, you know, some of these items are, are more urgent than others. Oh. At Mary, why don't we, why don't we set it as a goal to have this completed as much as to have a goal that all these points have been addressed by the end of the fiscal year. But some of them may not be completed. But you can at least have a plan or something to to provide us that this is being researched, this is being worked on. Um, this it. it not completed now, but we will have it completed, you know, sometime in the future because we need to do X, Y, and Z. So at least if we have a plan for the ones that are open, we we know how long it's going to take us and where we're going with it. And I think even once we have plans in place and we've responded to these, there's also going to be a period of time that we're going to need to follow up to make sure everything has been implemented and working the way we think it is. Yeah. And so I, so what, I guess what I would say is that uh, we're, we're happy to give an update at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we're I, honestly, we're not going to be done and there will be, uh, you know, there, there may be some things in here that we have to purchase a product or we have to uh, hire somebody to do something. So there's going to be time involved uh, going out to bid for those services, those products. Uh, this is, and then I, I wanted to add another thing into the mix and I, I'm happy to consider this. And I'm happy to go back and I can talk to the first elect woman. And the reason I say that is because I think part of this is going to be uh, I don't want to say dependent on it, but one of the factors is going to be the reorganization, which is, you know, one of the things that we're working on now as, uh, a, you know, a part of putting together a budget as well. And that that may help to create some efficiencies or free up time or, uh, you know, it, it, it might help us to get through these things a little better. And, um, and it's also, it also may determine which one we focus on more and and which ones not so there there are just there are just so many factors it's i that's the um, and i i don't mean to be evasive and i'm not trying to be difficult it's just there i'm just trying to say it's 
the reality is it's this is very difficult to pin down. And so, but I will I will go back and I make that commitment. I'll go back and talk to the first elect woman, and we will uh, have this conversation and see if we can maybe come up with some kind of goal for uh, having at least the ones that we uh, we know that we want to address done. I'll have that conversation with her. Um, thank you. I'll just, I mean, we can move on from this. Just, uh, I'll just close with uh, two thoughts. One being, you know, the fact that we have so many moving parts and there's a lot of competing priorities to me is, is more reason to nail this down in a plan with due dates. Um, it becomes more critical. Otherwise, it's just really easy for this stuff to get off the radar. And dates can change for, for valid reasons. You know, absolutely. It happens all the time. But I, I think having the plan is key. The other thing I would say, Jared, is, you know, this can't be all Connie. Connie's got a really important role here. But to the extent these, you know, many of these recommendations um, relate to, you know, some of these are HR related things, you know, and HR has got to own them. You know, things like job descriptions. Some of this is DPW and they've got to own them. So it can't be a, you know, a team of one here. I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but I think. Um, you know, as we kind of dig in and, and look at what they are, you know, Connie will have a role. Um, I know we don't have the whole working group together anymore, but I really think that, you know, much of this work may be dispersed um, among the people who are going to be responsible for ultimately, you know, operationalizing it. So um, just leave it with at that. And I, uh, you know, again, thanks for your thoughts and for the work. And uh, I don't, Jim or Mary, I, do you have anything else or? Should we? Okay. Okay. Um, so we're going on to item number seven, which is to hear, consider, and um, and act upon any uh, communications. Um, what I would like to do is add a couple of items onto the agenda that I dropped off somehow when I was typing the agenda um, and meant to include. Um, so the first one is that we wanted to hear um, an update from Connie on um, the internal audits that she's done um, in the last six months. And she did provide us with the schedule because I did ask for that uh, last week. Um, and I, um, I will see where we are with that. Um, Trying to find it. <laughs> so, Connie, do you want to provide us with that update? Yes, I will. Um, I submitted a report of internal audit activities for the period of July 1 through December 31, 2020. Well, I'm wondering if it's. I'm sorry. That was Fair TV. I think that was Jerry. So, sorry, Connie. Go ahead. And are we That's looking right. at the. Can we, I just want to clarify, are we looking at the document that says um, fiscal year 2020, July 1 through December 31st? What's uh, yes, July 1 mm -hmm. through December 31, 2020. That is correct. Okay. Actually, yeah, it should be fiscal year. Yeah, and uh, that's correct. With internal it, it audit. Be, yes, and it's the report of uh, internal audit. And as you can see from my audit report, uh, there were five internal audits that were performed. Uh, one was the development of a townwide policy that's still in draft form relating to town vehicles. And there was a plethora of financial accounting and other uh, work that was done throughout that time period as well. Um, the bulk of the internal audit time was focused uh, primarily on three major tasks. The, obviously, the DPW independent audit report, the working group meetings, and the follow-up on the audit findings and recommendations. And secondly, a uh, second big task was tracking and submitting COVID expenses for reimbursements to both FEMA and the state of Connecticut. Um, which was a voluminous task. And to date, we've received $952,474 in reimbursement. And I anticipate another $101,000 uh, from FEMA 
for the period of July through December as for reimbursement as well to the town. Uh, and the other uh, big job was the capital planning meeting and spreadsheets associated with um, the whole capital planning for the town of Fairfield. So uh, would you like a recap of the audit report? Uh, there were no material or significant weaknesses noted. However, there were recommendations made to improve operations and strengthen internal controls. Um, and the audits were performed upon the request of the chief administrative officer and as well as um, came about through the DPW independent audit. Connie, um, can you first, maybe first, give us, okay. a, I'm sorry, can you, could you maybe just briefly tell us, um, I, I'm assuming there weren't, you know, sure. too many recommendations for each report. Could you just briefly go through each report and hit the high points in terms of what your recommendations were? Yes, basically. So the first one was the Burr Mansion. I reviewed their annual budget, their income statements, the management agreement, their financial statements. Um, the chief administrative officer just wanted to get a feel of how their operations were doing. Um, and I had some findings and recommendations. Uh, they do have three leases uh, that are on the third floor of the Burr Homestead. Uh, the leases were expired. I had requested that the town attorney uh, update those leases and um, renew them. The um, basically, See, there weren't, wasn't anything of major earth shattering nature. There was, um, they're required under the management agreement to have the rates that they charge for activities approved by the Board of Selectmen. And that was last time they were approved was in 2018 under the old administration. And I felt that under the new administration should be reviewed and approved uh, to see if the rates were reasonable. And the same thing with the management fee. They do charge us a $34,000 management fee uh, as part of their uh, income statement uh, for the Burr Homestead. And their, uh, the agreement with the town says it must be approved by the Board of Selectmen. The last time it was approved was in 2016, and I felt that the new administration should review it and approve it to see if it appears reasonable to them. Um, other than that, uh, the operations, you know, obviously due to COVID, they, they, this year the, the revenue is, is, is very small and then low. But, um, you know, hopefully within the completion of the, the next year, hopefully things will look up. Uh, the next one was the, I did a review of this solid waste and recycling facility uh, of their cash register operations and the role of the guardhouse attendant and responsibilities. Um, I know this is a subject that always comes up at a different board of finance meetings. So um, basically, I felt that the scale house uh, attendant was a crucial, uh, per performed a vital role in internal control in ensuring that revenue was captured in, um, at the scale house and through the solid waste facility. They do make, uh, receive over $3 million in revenue a year. So I, I felt it's important to keep the guardhouse attendants at the site. Um, I did recommend that the scale reway ticket be printed from the PC scale system rather than the cash register because there's no correlation between the two. And that's something I hope um, that I can tackle within the next month or two. Um, unfortunately, the Solid waste manager retired, so hopefully with the new manager we can uh, work with PC Scale to have those two linked together. Uh, I also did an uh, audit review. Sorry. Yeah. Can you just explain that a little? You caught my attention there. So this is we get three million dollars of revenue from from so these operations. Uh, solid waste and recycling facility. Okay. So in terms of the scale, so what you're saying is that in terms of evidence of what was taken in as revenue, we have what came in on the cash yeah. register ticket, but we don't have how, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't know if that was the correct amount. That was just what got put in the cash yeah, register. No, no, no. Yeah, let me, let me clarify that. Basically, uh, someone is required to reweigh. Uh, so what they will do is they'll go, they, Customer will go on the scale. They'll uh, 
the gross tear weight, which is the gross weight of the vehicle plus the, the garbage, uh, will be stored in the system. Then they print out a little ticket from the cash register that says zero dollars on it, and they're allowed to enter into the facility and dump. On their way out of the facility, they have to stop back at the cash register system. The vehicle now is reweighed next to the garbage. So now mm -hmm. you've got the, just to be, so now you know exactly how much the garbage was because you have the, the net weight. And then they pay their fee. However, if someone is just getting a ticket from a cash register that's a zero on it and that you have to go back and reweigh, how do I know that the person just doesn't leave the facility and never reweighs or, you know, yeah. or if they even weighed in at the, in the first place? Yeah. So I wanted them to, I wanted there to be a connection between the scale weighing and the, a ticket for them to enter into the facility. This way I'm always guaranteed that everybody who, who enters the facility has properly weighed, that everybody exits the facility has properly paid. I no, that's, want to take that chance that someone could leave without paying. No, th thank you. So I, and I, the thought process is the right one, you know, as, as an auditor, you think, okay, if somebody wanted to get around this and right. sort of circumvent the system, how could they do that? So, and exactly. you made recommendations on this. Have those been implemented yet? I made the recommendation uh, most recently, probably within the last, I want to say month or so. Um, there, uh, prior to the retirement of the scale house manager, he was going to contact the PC scale uh, company to see if this is something that can be implemented. And um, I also suggested that he speak to other municipalities to see how they do it. They must use the same type of software, I would imagine. So we were going to look into that to make sure, um, you know, that we could uh, implement it properly and efficiently. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I guess the other thing I just threw out is whenever there's a change in personnel, um, yeah. there's always some level of additional risk of things falling through the cracks or things not being done. So that that sounds like one that we'd want to, you know, make sure that we follow up on and and make sure that who's ever got responsibility for it now is is aware of the recommendation. And, you know, right. even if we can't get the systemic fix in, immediately that, you know, somebody understands what the issue is and, and what the risk might be. There might be another workaround. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. And the next one was the garage uh, parts room inventory and internal controls. I went to the DPW garage and assisted them uh, with their inventory and reviewed the procedures that they were using to take uh, conduct the inventory and take count. Um, they had the site was immaculate. It was neat. It was clean. They were recording everything properly. I did test samples, uh, found no discrepancies. Uh, I reviewed their operations. I documented their procedures. And um, they, they're very happy. They used a, a software system that tracks their inventory uh, coming in and going out, uh, which they're very satisfied with. Um, I made some recommendations. The county is this I, new? Is, is doing the inventory new to them? Is this one of the new have, findings that have, you're implementing? Well, they have been tracking things using a software system, uh, an inventory software system, but I just do not believe they were ever tracing what was in the system to what was on the shelf. So now we have a correlation between what we have documented in the inventory system to what is actually on the shelf and what we have on hand in the two agree. Okay, and so they'll do formal inventories at least at year yeah, end so or several times from year? Yeah, so my recommendation was that they perform a regularly scheduled annual inventory. I also suggested, recommended that they perform random checks of the inventory on a, a regular basis, perhaps a monthly basis, and any uh, you know irregularities or unusual counts have to be reported to management. I also have recommended that uh, they document uh, 
procedures around the security and the you know how to conduct the inventory, how to uh, you know track it, and um, I had recommended cross training in case of absence or you know someone retires, then someone else can easily slip into their place and and uh, perform the job. Um, I also had recommended that perhaps explore the possibility of purchasing an inventory software system that is directly linked to Munich, and such a system would automatically update the parts room inventory as items are purchased and received, and then this direct correlation will ensure that all items received in Munich are properly accounted for and entered into inventory. However, uh, with discussions with the garage supervisor and the parts foreman, they're very satisfied with the current system and they feel it meets their needs. Um, it's updated on a regular basis and they also have 24 hour on call uh, assistance if they need help. So that they're very happy with what they are doing at, down, you know, with the inventory system at the garage. Uh, the next one was I did an analysis of parks division outsourced park maintenance, uh, the cost of, of in-house labor compared to uh, out, outsourcing. So basically, uh, that uh, recommendation was I said that sometimes they have to do special projects uh, that are outside of the bid, and sometimes these projects can be expensive. And I said, if a project falls outside of the scope of the bid award, then the DPW operation should be determined if it could be performed efficiently and effectively in-house with in-house staff. Um, if not, then the project should be bid and uh, you know, follow town charter threshold and guidelines. If, and if time constraints prevent the execution of a proper bid, then the work should be considered an emergency procurement and follow town purchasing guidelines. Uh, what I found was sometimes projects were, were very expensive and probably, you know, maybe could have been done in house at a cheaper, cheaper rate using in house labor. The next one was uh, town solar site. Uh, I did an amendment to a previous audit on the town solar. First time in 29 years, I had to amend an audit, but I did. And a uh, previous audit uh, was uh, surrounded savings pertaining to solar sites in town. And uh, I was provided with a rate of 17 cents per kilowatt hour was what we were comparing our solar energy to what we were paying United Illuminates. And the calculation appeared reasonable, the 17 cents appeared reasonable based on uh, the method of calculation. However, when I was speaking to our energy consultant and United Illuminates personnel, I discovered that perhaps they, they had told me that that rate was a little inflated and it was closer to more like 11 and a half cents to 13 cents. So obviously, um, our contracts that we were entering into for solar, we were comparing uh, the rates we were paying to 17 cents of electricity versus more accurate would be closer to 11.5 cents. So what I had suggested, re recommended was that uh, the town for all future solar contracts, uh, they consult with the United Illuminating and get the average kilowatt rate over a 36 month period before you enter into, into any contract to ensure that the rate that you are contracting into is less than what you would have been paying United Illuminating, then hence you're always guaranteed a saving. So, um, and then I had also recommended that a secondary review be performed of any uh, of the solar contracts and along with analyses to confirm that the cost benefit is there prior to entering into the contract. And as well, I also had suggested that to make sure that all these solar agreements uh, follow town uh, charter guidelines in terms of bid. 
Any other questions? I know it's a lot to <laughs> kind of recap. No, that's I that's that's helpful. Um, I think we and you know, Mr. Brown. I know we. Um, I know the Board of Finance is supposed to get a a periodic review from Connie of of her internal audit activity. I think it's been about a year since we've done that, so maybe we can talk about putting that on a future agenda. But Connie, this is great. I think if we get an update for the full board, what would be helpful is to um, you know prepare it in a fashion that shows you know here's the audit, here's the recommendation, here's the status of the mediation, kind of similar to the tracker, but but this is work. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, actually, we're supposed the Board of Finance is supposed to get a, an update or in, in a review at least, well, I shouldn't say at least, between once and twice a year. And I think the last time, Connie, we had an update was at Sherman School, and I can't remember what month that was. It was pre COVID. It was yeah. pre COVID, right? We were together it without masks. I believe it was January of. Yeah. Of, uh, okay. Yeah, last, I want to say, maybe it was January this year. Okay, so we'll look and see what's on our February agenda. Um, if not, you know, we have two meetings in February, but we should get yeah. this done before we hit the budget season. So yeah. we'll figure that out. Okay. Jim, since we already scheduled um, Connie for February 2nd, Maybe that would be a good meeting because that way we only bring her out one night. What what uh, what night was that? Um, February second, we scheduled another audit committee meeting. Okay, great. So we will um, we'll get you on the agenda, kind of. If you could just make a note of that, February second to the full board of finance. That's great. And I, the other thing I just uh, say is is since it's been a year, even though this even though this report here, Connie, that you've just given us covers six months, um, for the full board of finance, it should probably go, you know, since the last one. So you know, the last twelve months, and and uh, you know, again, format wise, I would put the the um, the recommendations and responses, status of remediation, and then also let us know if one of the big questions I recall. They came up at the last board of finance meeting when we talked about this was, you know, whether there was any follow up to make sure that the um, the recommendations had in fact been implemented. So you could just, you know, on on what whatever document you give us, it would be helpful to to um, you know to have that as well, and then we can sort of post that for the board of finance along with the uh, the actual reports themselves. And um, the reports are good; they provide background information, but I think for purposes of going through it. You know, something in a, a format that's you know like the tracker would just be a little, little easier to follow through. So, uh, that would be my recommendation. But, but thank you again. Okay. Anything else? Any other comments or questions for Connie? Okay, so the, the final thing that I forgot to put on the agenda, and I guess we'll probably need a motion for this one, is um, that we were supposed to hold our organizational meeting and um, and vote on officers um, for the audit subcommittee for 2021. Um, I'm going to make a recommendation that. Um, well, I guess first, can I have a motion to put this on the agenda? Um, I'll second. Lori makes the motion I, and Jim seconds it. All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Um, so, so what I was going to make a motion was to um, to add Lori as the chairman for this audit committee. Um, this has been Lori's career, and she has recently retired and has more time to spend on it and um, really provide a nice service for the town. Um, so I'd like to make a motion that we select Lori as the chair for the audit subcommittee. Uh, can I have a second? I'll second. Um, <laughs> being seconded by Jim Brown. All in favor? 
Uh, so it's unanimous. Great. <laughs> Um, congratulations, Lori. Um, I will let you take it over from here and um, do the final part of the meeting. Oh, no, I think you have to finish since you were, uh, you know, chair at the start. I guess we need, do we need the uh, vice chair and secretary? Yes, I think we I need the vice chair. For formal purposes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so does anyone want to make a motion for vice chair of the audit subcommittee? I I would like to make that motion, Ms. Claire, and I like to nominate uh, you as a, as a vice chair. Uh, you may not have the time to be chair at this point, or at least the time that's needed. But but you have the knowledge and you have the background to certainly uh, run these meetings when necessary, and to be a um, to be a supporter of this committee. And to be able to, uh, you know, keep this in line, and keep us in track. And you've been doing this a long time, so I'd like to nominate you as vice chair. Can I have a second? You need a second. Seconded by Ms. Charlton. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's if you accept, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll finish and we'll, um, I'll take a motion for secretary. Um, Nominate Mr. Matola. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take a motion to, uh, I'll put forth a motion to uh, nominate Mr. Brown as secretary since, uh, you know, he's the only one left standing. <laughs> and I'll make a second, um, I'll second that. All in favor? Aye, it's unanimous. Um, okay, uh, are there any other things that we should consider or discuss um, before it, prior to ending the meeting? Any communications? Uh, I don't see any. Um, so I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, Lori makes the motion. Jim seconds it. All, all in favor? And we're done. Right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, everyone. And Lori will be in charge next time. All right. Congratulations. <laughs>